my phone. Okay, good. Good morning, everyone. Cool. It, it is amazingly Seeking Sustainability Live number 36. Wow, this week we're going to hit 40 in the series. I'm so thankful and excited to have Kevin O'Shea, a longtime podcaster and fellow long term in Japan resident, raising a family here. Hi, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Hello, thank you for asking me to join you today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for joining. Do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Sure thing. Um, well, yeah, um, my name is Kevin O'Shea. Uh, I am originally from Canada, but mind you, I've been now living in Asia for about 20 years almost. Uh, lived in Korea, Japan, and China. The bulk of that time has been in Japan. I spent, spent about 10 years living in Kobe. And um, a few years back, my family and I moved to Beijing, China. I'm an international school teacher, and we went where the opportunities took us. Um, spent two years in Beijing. Beijing was not a good fit for me as uh, someone who enjoys the outdoors. Uh, so we, we headed down south, right near Hong Kong, to a city called Shenzhen. And uh, yeah, so obviously uh, early on in this COVID-19 time, obviously China was where things first kind of went wild and crazy. Uh, so in early February, my family and I, for our own comfort and safety, decided to come to Japan, um, which is where my wife is from. And um, soon after that, the borders of China closed. And uh, now we find ourselves, we've been in Osaka now for four months. Um, I've been teaching remotely. Uh, my kids have been doing their online learning and uh, we're, we're here indefinitely. Um, but yeah, so I'm really passionate about um, uh, outdoor education and nature education. I kind of like to distinguish them. Um, I, I often, in my mind, when I think of outdoor education, I think of uh, you know children doing things like you know getting up and doing kayaking and climbing and and bouldering and things like this. I'm about connecting children with bugs, birds, teaching them about biodiversity, nature, um, and yeah, that's that's my thing. I'm passionate about learning about insects. Um, birds, plants, biodiversity, ecology, all that wonderful stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. And if people want to find you, uh, what's the best place for them to find you? You're all over the place. Um, Instagram, I'm YouTube, all, yeah. website. What's the main website that you would recommend? Makingteachersbetter.com um, is one of yours, right? Well, the make, 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 makingbetterteachers.com. Oh, sorry. Um, which was... Yeah, no problem, no problem. That was the name of a podcast that I had, Making Better Teachers. Um, uh, Twitter, at Mad from Maple. I'm all over Twitter. Um, uh, let's see, uh, on Instagram, I have a, a page. It's all my nature photography. It's called Shizen Wildlife. And Shizen, S-H-I-Z-E-N, is a Japanese word for nature. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm on uh, YouTube as Busan Kevin. And uh, there's a whole ton of, literally, literally more than a thousand videos, I think, there. Um, mostly from my years in Japan and lots of other stuff. Yeah, so I'm all over the map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if anybody's interested in uh, raising international family in Japan, you've got loads of resources for that. Uh, for a long time, you did the Just Japan podcast. Do you want to introduce that just a little bit? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, I, back in, oh gosh, 2015 maybe is when I started that, the Just Japan podcast. I, I realized at the time there was really kind of a, a dearth of podcasts about Japan, Japan content. Yet there's this massive audience around the world who just crave Japan anything. Um, so, uh, you know, realizing that my scope, my viewpoint of Japan is pretty limited. I'm a teacher. I go to school in the morning, come home in the afternoon, in the evening to my family, rinse, wash, repeat. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, you know, you can't, a podcast about my life wouldn't last very long. So what I decided to do was each week I would bring on a different guest and it was a weekly show to talk about different aspects of life in Japan, adventures in Japan. And I kind of wanted to get away from that kind of typical and no offense to teachers out there. I mean, I was a teacher, I am a teacher, but, um, I wanted to get people who had really different stories. So, uh, again, each week, different people would come on, people who worked as scientists in Japan, business owners adventurers um you know so yeah so if you go to justjapanstuff.com just japan stuff um there's more than 200 episodes there that you can listen to of and it's a long form podcast episodes are usually about an hour long and there's just some fascinating people i got to talk to over the years and some fascinating stories about japan 
Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, I saw 200th episode on May 19th, mm -hmm. 2019. So last year, mm -hmm. May, uh, have you been doing it this year much or you kind of stopped last year? No. Yeah, I, you know, I'm going to be honest. I think when I left Japan and moved to Beijing and was really, I started to really kind of focus more on my kind of professional self as an international teacher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I suppose that the further, the more time I spent away from Japan, um, kind of lost the mojo to be putting out that kind of content. Uh, and, and then I, I started focusing again more on my professional development, which is why I created the Making Better Teachers podcast. Right. Um, and you know, I've got a great network out there on Twitter of international teachers. And this was something I was kind of, kind of gearing towards them. I refer to it as free professional development. And I started creating that podcast. I think I made about 25 or 26 episodes. Um, and, and yeah, so that was great. I got to network with some fantastic educators from around the world, but that, that kind of slowed down too. um, got to admit when you are a professional teacher, and then with all of your free time, you're making a podcast about teaching. Um, the, the kind of line between work and personal life gets faded. And it just felt like I was always working. Right, yeah. So, yeah, so I stepped away from that. Um, and uh, so now, and now I'm developing a new podcast, which is I'm pretty excited about, um, which is going to be a lot more shiny and polished than my previous ones. So, um, again, so tell I'm us a little excited. bit about your new one. You said it's it's focused on nature and kids' education for nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so like you know, at my school, I'm in every school I've ever worked at. I'm known as the bug guy, um, and I, I always jokingly say, if you want to be the most popular teacher at an elementary school, be the bug guy, because <laughs> I'm I'm literally kids always see me walking around holding containers, and the inside those containers are usually like mantises and spiders and things like this. Um, so the kids always run up to me no matter what grade level. They're like, wow, Mr. Roche, what's that? What do you have? Um, so I am passionate about insects and, and nature and ecology. So I've decided, and a lot of people have been suggesting I do this, I'm, I'm making an educational podcast for kids. So it's very going to be very kid speak, kids language, um, about insects. <laughs> and uh, eat, the, the plan is each episode I will be bringing on an expert um, and the, the, the questions are going to be generated by children. I've already got some adorable little questions. I've got about seven or eight kids from around the world who've already recorded questions to ask the expert. And um, the first episode will be a general one. And then after that, there'll be like themes, like a summer episode where we can focus on things like cicadas and things like that. Um, and yeah, so um, again, I'm not sure how long each episode will be um, kind of geared towards kids. So maybe not so long. And uh, yeah, so um, right now the working title is Bugging Out, the Bugging Out podcast, um, <laughs> a podcast for kids. And um, I've got someone working on a logo for me right now. I've got to put the site together and I want to do a nice, proper, shiny launch. Um, so yeah, that's going to be coming coming along. I'd say I'm, I'm hoping within the, the month that, that that project will be up and going. That's great. Let's Let's talk a bit about your insects. On your Instagram and and your channels, you yep. always have beautiful photos of insects. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, gorgeous. Uh, do you want to describe your insights or stories about some of them? I've got a moth, I've got a dragonfly, butterfly, and here we have the sphinx moth. Two different kinds of moth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I'm 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 quite passionate about nature photography. And when I was living here in Japan, I had a Facebook page called Birds of Kansai, Kansai no Tori. And um, I was really into bird photography. I, I was fortunate enough that I, would, I could cycle commute to school every day in Kobe. And I would cycle along the waterfront. And I would just throw my nice Nikon camera on my basket of my mama chari. And uh, leave, work, leave for work very early to give myself some time to take photos of, of birds. Um, bugs. Um, something I've always been interested in. Um, I think one of the one of the reasons I, I find them fascinating is because they're everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're living in the countryside or the big city, you're going to find these fascinating living creatures. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the pictures you've got there, um, and I see there is a, uh, in the top, there's a sphinx moth, or a humming, that's actually like a hummingbird hawk moth. 
um, which I love hummingbird hawk moths. If anyone's ever seen one, it, it could blow your mind away. They just kind of, usually you see them flying around um, in the day, the hot parts of the day, you know, sucking nectar out of flowers. And they really, they don't behave like a moth. Moths are nocturnal, um, but these guys aren't. <laughs> they just fly around in the daytime. They actually, there are no hummingbirds in Japan. Uh, it's a species that does not exist here. But these little critters look like hummingbirds. They move like hummingbirds. Um, and so I love that bug. Big fat caterpillars too. Um, <laughs> um, below that I see a common yellow swallowtail butterfly, which are very common, a common butterfly here in Japan. You see them all over the place. Also common in Animal Crossing, everyone. Um, <laughs> Animal, Animal Crossing is made in Japan by Nintendo. So if you want to learn about Japanese insects, Animal Crossing, because my kids play and my wife plays it, and, and they're always like, Dad, look at this. I'm like, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, there's a beautiful, uh, not sure the name of that dragonfly offhand. It's a gorgeous. Skimmer, I think. Bright kind of, red, yeah. Yeah, isn't it? The, some gorgeous ones. Um, and then, yeah, there's a picture of those moths. Those were in Beijing. I actually took those. Oh, okay. the, the other three are in, in Japan. Ones that below are in, in Beijing. And uh, that was a little not safe for work action, a couple of moths making more moths. I remember all the kids gather around saying, Mr. O'Shea, what are they doing? Like, They're making more moths, everybody. We'll just <laughs> describe it as that. Um, but yeah, so I, I've got a, that, my Instagram, um, she's in wildlife, which I'm trying to showcase my, my nature photography. And um, I do a lot of macro photography. And yeah, uh, yeah it's fun. It's, I think I've it's, got, it's getting I've out got there. I've got some, no some more here. Uh, bees. Let's talk about bees a little bit because on your uh, Twitter, the, you were addressing a lot of the the hype, shall we say, about the killer hornets. The, the killer, hornets. yes. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Which is exactly the sound that every entomologist around the world did. They all went, ugh. <laughs> um, yeah, the giant Asian hornets, right? That was just. Um, yeah, the giant Japanese hornet, Osuzume bachi, or the sparrow bee, when you actually translate it from Japanese, right? I like that better, sparrow bee. Yeah, they're, they're incredible, incredible insects. So I've been fascinated by wasps and hornets for years. And on some of my other Facebook pages that are not so active anymore, I've got a lot of photos that I'm going to transfer over to Shizen Wildlife. But, um, and I love paper wasps. Oh my gosh, Ashina Gabachi. I'm always I love to get close to them and photograph them. I love watching their behavior. And um, one thing I do teach people, I try to teach people, as much as you think that wasps and hornets are yucky and icky or dangerous, for the most part, they're not dangerous. Um, they don't bother people unless you bother them. And they have a very important role. They're called biocontrol agents. So, you know, if, if, for any, if anyone out there is listening is into agriculture, you know, there's a lot of caterpillars that can wreak havoc on your crops and your plants. Well, luckily, you've got wasps out there. And for a lot of wasps like the Yashinagabachi, um, the Japanese paper wasps, their main food source are caterpillars. So they actually get out there. They're, they're considered helpful by farmers and people in agriculture. Um, the Osuzumebachi, the murder hornets, I mean, they're a native species to Japan, usually found in the mountains, in the forests, not in the cities. Um, I don't see them in Osaka. But I definitely see them if I'm ever hiking in Kobe on Mount Roko. Um, and yeah, they've been here for a millennia. Like that, they're, they're native and they, um, you know, if, if, you know, if you're a beekeeper, you're not going to like them very much. Um, yeah. <laughs> but they're not when something I, that the average... When I visited a beekeeper last year and he showed me um, that he had to kill them. But he comes from a biology background and he understands that. And he, he said, I feel really bad. I have to kill them but they're eating yeah. my honeybees. And so yeah. I have to, you know, there's no other way, but if I don't kill them, they'll bring their whole hive here and that'll be the end yeah, of my exactly. bee farm. So, but the paper wasps yeah. are on the upper left, I see those around my garden all the time and they're not aggressive. Yeah, yeah. No, they're not, eh? no, no, they're not at all. Um, I used to like to photograph their nests. I'd often search for their nests when I was living in Kobe. Um, even in the city, you know, under park benches and things, they like to build them um, where there's some shelter from the rain. And I mean, I could get within centimeters of their nests with my camera and those things never bothered me. I mean, you have to, you know, know how to move and 
you still need a, a, a level of carefulness. Yeah. But um, yeah, and those giant hornets. I mean, there's a there's a, a beekeeper who I follow on Twitter and on YouTube um, named uh, Stephen Wheeler, and he's on Awaji Island, and uh, he's I think he's from New Zealand. He's been here. He'd be a great one to have in your show actually sometime. He um, I'll, I'll give you details. He's been he's been living in Japan for about 30 years, and he beekeeps on on Awaji Island, and, and he makes videos too on YouTube and about how he has to kill them, you know, the, or put up the sticky traps and stuff. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I mean, if your livelihood is, is beekeeping, you've got to protect your bees, right? Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people, yeah, yeah. like I try to be plant-based, I try to be vegan. A lot of people will say I won't have anything with honey in it. Um, but when I visited the beekeeper, I was very impressed how careful they are in taking care of the hive, keeping the hive so healthy, keeping the bees from year to year. And I think a lot of the commercial beehives in the States, they might destroy the bees after the season. But he was saying how the small farm beekeepers in Japan are very careful with their hive. They try to keep them as healthy as possible. They either release them or they keep them until the next year. So it seems like a much more mm -hmm. sustainable and ecological type of beekeeping. So I'm not sure. I think a lot of things like that, you, there is no black and white. It's kind of case by case, right? Yeah, and I think, I mean, the farming practices, for example, even in Japan are so different than in, say, America or Canada. Just, I mean, you know, there's, there's so much monoculture going on in America and Canada. Um, and unfortunately, that, I mean, there's so much, that's so detrimental. And at the end of the day, you look and say, okay, farmers do need to make a living, right? Um, how are they going to do that? If it's through canola, if it's through corn for ethanol or this or that. But at the end of the day, like Japan, because of its geography, you know, the mountainous terrain, um, they simply, it's, it's, you know, they have to do crop rotation. They can't have those big type of factory farms. Um, so I think the farming practices are different. So I'm, I'm assuming that the beekeeping practices would be very different as well. Well, he was, yeah. he was telling me, and I think this is probably true for most beekeepers in the States, um, as well. You have to be near a water source, clean water source. Mm -hmm. So he's on Miyajima Island, which is our most famous island, beautiful for nature. And he's next to the mm. forest, and he says the forest is great for bees as well, which I didn't realize. It's not only flowers they pollinate, but he's also next to an organic farm. So they kind of work together, the beekeeper and the organic farm. And the organic farm yeah. people were saying the bees, they cross-pollinate some of their vegetables. So sometimes you'll, you'll get cucumbers that are a different color or a different variety. Oh, wow because of the action of the bees and what they're pollinating from the forest in other areas. I thought that was wow, really cool. That's very cool. But he was that saying is, yeah. he, can't, he can't have a bee farm anywhere near Japanese uh, rice farming because they use too many pesticides. And he can't, uh, okay. he can't be near people's houses because of home sprays or pesticides that people use in their gardens or even cleaners in the house so it's they're very susceptible to man-made chemicals i didn't yeah. realize that well i mean yeah. that, well i mean that's that's the whole problem within the states and canada i mean it just seems like the world is against them right you don't i mean you have like you have with again with the monoculture and like farmers using roundup and things like that i mean that's just killing all the wildflowers they people often who are i think are uneducated call them weeds um, but those wildflowers that grow in between the rows naturally are so essential for food sources for those for those bees. So like when I drive when I visit Canada in the summer and I I'm driving through rural eastern Canada and farm country, I mean you're looking at these massive basically food deserts for pollinators. I mean that's what they are. So um, it's it's nice even here in in the big city of Osaka to walk through a park and see, um, and luckily Osaka's, I think their budget for parks isn't so good, so they can't really maintain them, so they get pretty wild, which I love. Yeah. Because that means there's clover everywhere, and there's <laughs> flea bane growing everywhere, and poppies everywhere, and just happy bees. Like, I get to see, you know, um, honeybees um, around, and um, it's pretty cool that a uh, guy I mentioned, Stephen Wheeler, who's the, he, he just taught me on Twitter, um, through DM, he taught me how to distinguish European from Japanese honeybees. Oh yeah, the native. It's very subtle. It's very subtle, but I'm practicing. It's something. It's got to do with the shape of the veins in their wings, making a different shape and a little bit of coloration. So now I'm, I'm going through my pictures of bees I've been taking, 
in Japan and like trying to figure out is that a European honeybee or is that a native Japanese honeybee? Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, bees bees are yeah. amazing and they need our support. So even if you can't uh, have a beehive and protect them, you can plant wild flowers. You can, yeah. you know, what what else can you do? Just try not to use so many pesticides or chemicals. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I think like an important thing is, and, I, and I've always planted pollinator gardens at the different schools I've worked at, but also choosing native wildflowers you, you want to choose native flowers yeah. because often the the if, if it's a native if it's a native insect they'll go towards that but often they don't um when you see a lot of uh, alien plants ones that are not indigenous often the bees want nothing to do with them no interest and also i've, I've heard it's well no i i know it's important to choose a different variety of flowers that will bloom at different times during the seasons you want stuff that's going to bloom in the spring in the summer and into the fall so the bees have a constant food source throughout their season. That's nice. Yeah. Um, you have a picture of a bumblebee here as well. I have this plant with white, like very dense flowers and the bumblebees are just like lying in it and rolling around in it. They just love it. It's like catnip to them. It's, you know, yeah. so, so there's certain plants yeah, there's... that they just love, eh? Oh yeah, yeah, and those, those I'm sure that those bees are uh, probably the kumabachi, right? Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they're they're, um, they're actually uh, Japanese carpenter bees. Oh yeah. And yeah, um, yeah so they're they're larger than a like a, a North American bumblebee, but they're just I love them. They're fantastic. They're gentle giants. Like there's nothing aggressive about them, and I love the way they hover. Um, um, and here's a little fact: very easy to distinguish a male from a female. Females face all black. Males have a big yellow, like square, right where their nose would be, and uh, the males have no stingers. So if you can, if you are good enough to know which one is a male, um, uh, you know you can freak people out by grabbing one gently with your hand. <laughs> like, look what I can do! <laughs> Whoa! Didn't sting me. Well, but if you accidentally do that to a female, it's going to be a very painful day for you. Yeah. Oh, we, we got a comment uh, from My Planet, My Life, Joanna Arai, who I talked to last week. She says, hello, Joy and Kevin. Awesome conversation. Wow. How did European honeybees appear in Japan? Brought on purpose? Uh, accident? Any insights? Oh, that's absolutely on purpose. Um, they're, they're, they're brought here for commercial means. So the whole thing is with... Um, I mean, the European honeybees obviously are invasive to America and Canada too, right? They're European honeybees. But the thing is, is that they have a much more productive yield of honey. Um, a European honeybee produces about 10 times more honey than a native Japanese bee. So at the end of the day, um, if, if you're into kind of larger scale honey production, um, it just makes sense. They're going to, in that regard, they're going to yield more, more product equals more money, right? Um, but again, they are not native to to Japan. So um, I've also heard that the Japanese honeybees are a little more wild to ha to kind of wrangle. Um, you know, they they just they'll they'll take off, for example, like the whole colony will leave if they're under stress. Um, I was watching some videos by that guy, uh, Stephen Wheeler, and he was saying that there's not Osuzumebachi, but it's a different it's like Kiro, Kiro Suzumebachi or something, the yellow hornets, which are smaller. They'll come and kind of hang around the honeybee nests or the hives and kind of harass them and put stress on them. So what happens is that the honeybees don't want to forage anymore. They just stay inside the hive. And eventually they get hungry and then the whole the whole colony will just leave. And then they're done. Like you don't you have an empty hive. Um, whereas in the European honeybees, you can manage them easier, they can stick around. But at the same time, since they're not native, they're more susceptible to predators, predation. Um, that kind of thing. And I, I'm going to also assume that, you know, some of those hives get away, they swarm, they fly off, and that's why you can find them around. Because um, I took a photo recently on um, Facebook, and I put on, on, on Shizen Wildlife, my Instagram, and a beekeeper left a comment and said, oh, that's a European honeybee. And I took that picture in a park, like I'm downtown Osaka. Wow. So there must be like, a honey farm, maybe not so far away. Because they're, they're pretty that. territorial, like they don't mm. travel that far. 
like the Miyajima uh, honey farm, he was saying they they basically maybe three kilometers at the most they would go. So it's a really yeah. small area that they're in. And he was using European honeybees as well. And okay. he, he was talking about you have to be careful of the swarm. So you can't have more than one queen in each and you have to balance the number of worker bees. And it was really interesting. I had no idea how complicated it is. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I've been fascinated with beekeeping for about two years now. Um, you know, living in an apartment in big cities isn't really conducive to beekeeping. But, um, you know, someday um, when I do have property, um, but I've been I've been a, a big follower of a YouTube channel called Vino Farm and Vino Farm. He's a guy I think he's in northern Pennsylvania and he just got into beekeeping about three or four years ago. And he's a great vlogger, great style, great charisma. And he's been documenting it all. And it gets very inside baseball sometimes. <laughs> but um, I've been really fascinated with watching, you know, it, it, you know, he explains everything, how he has to check for mites and how he removes mites and all these yeah. kind of cool things. And he even did a video about how on his farm, how he has to plant flowers that will bloom at all those different times and um, how when they forage on, like, say, goldenrod and others forage on a different type of flower, the honey is so different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the honey's a darker color with different flavor. Exactly. And... Miyajima Honey Farm as well. He was telling me uh, it's more watery at certain times of the year and then more dense mm -hmm. at different times of the year. So they're also because the bees are drinking more water. And isn't that interesting? Oh, wow. Yeah. Really cool. Mm -hmm. So every season, yeah. even at the same location, every season's honey is different. Because, oh, yeah. yeah. Because the bees are... are taking in different things, right? Yeah. yeah well, so um, cool. appar apparently I did, I did hear from a beekeeper that there are some people in Osaka who do keep bees. Because again, like you said, they keep a pretty small territory. So what are they doing foraging in white clover in a park in downtown Osaka? Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, one of the really cool sustainable tourism businesses I found was in New York City. And it was, uh, they were doing beekeeping on top of their hotel right in the middle of Manhattan really cool um, and that was that was part of their branding is that they have their own honeybees so you have fresh honey from their honey farm on the roof as part of your dining oh, wow, okay. experience and stuff i thought that was really cool and they said they did it because of course it's really hard to have honeybees supported in the middle of the city so they built a rooftop garden and i thought that's a great oh, wow. urban alternative right yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I've heard that like beekeeping is becoming more popular. Urban beekeeping is becoming a thing. I know even like on a, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, I think I heard that's kind of like Canada's NPR um, on their headquarters in Toronto. They've got beehives up on their roof and uh, it was kind of kind of neat. Um, it's something I would love to I would love to get into that. Um, but, you know, uh, you need you need a big property. And I'm, I'm assuming to even at, at, like at a school level, I'm sure I would probably uh I'm sure there's some people who be like, that's a great idea. And others who would be like, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Until there's one kid who has a strong allergy, right? Then it'd be kind of scary. Well, Ma I mean, I Marissa think, has a comment yeah. from Facebook. Uh, she says, so interesting to hear about these bees. Thank you, Marissa. Thanks for commenting. Well, thank you. Yeah. No, I, I think I think there's, you know, there's a lot of myth busting that needs to be done, constant myth busting. And that's why, like, for example, um, you know, I take a lot of, have a lot of passion, and like for example, at my school, like this year, um, even though I was brand new to this area, of Shenzhen, my first time living in a subtropical climate, um, I very quickly tried to become a student of the bugs and insects around the campus, and then I made a field guide, um, and uh, I made these field guides, and I printed off hundreds of copies, went over my budget, had to go to my admin and be like, can I have more money on my printing budget? Um, and I, I placed them all around the school. I placed them in the, the, you know, the early years. I put them on the walls. I put them on notice boards. I, 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 just, I gave them up for free in the elementary school. And then I made another one for birds as well. But what was so wonderful was I was getting seeing pictures on Twitter from upper grade teachers. I teach early years myself, like grade four, grade five teachers who were like, look at this. This is, this is amazing at lunchtime. And you'd see all this, these groups of grade five kids with my bug guide like running around in the trees and stuff on campus trying to find these different insects. And 
you know, you always hear people say, oh, bees are dangerous, bees sting, um, or bees bite. I always love that one. They don't bite. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm like, actually, no, they don't. Like, that's, I mean, yeah, they do if, if, if harmed or in danger. Um, which is why I, I would say to kids, when I would do workshops about insects, I'd, I'd say, okay, have you ever walked up to a flower and seen a honeybee drinking nectar? And you walk up to that honeybee and you open your hand and you grab it and you squeeze your honeybee. And they're like, no, I've never done that. I'm like, and that's why you've never been stung before. Because <laughs> that's about the only way a bee's going to sting you is if you walk up and you swat it or you grab it. Um, you know, so, it, you know, I try to teach kids and, and their parents too. Um, that's something I've done recently. I created a group in Shenzhen. I called Nature Shenzhen. And um, I started doing something called Community Nature Walks, where I asked families, not just the kids, I want their moms and dads to come on weekends. And I take them for like guided walks. And we have themes, insects, birds, birding, invasive plant species. And I teach the families about these things because it's about getting that parent buy-in. And also, when a kid comes to school and they're like, Mr. O'Shea, bees are dangerous. Well, they're hearing that from somewhere. And often it's from mom and dad who also don't know. Um, so there's a level of um, ignorance. And, you know, it's, it's great to teach the parents how important it is for their kids to like bugs. It's important to teach the kids so they can go home and teach their parents. And, you know, ideally, my, my goal always is with my, my you know, the things I teach at school and my, my community work is that the kids that I teach – my dream, if things work out, is that when they grow up, they're going to become ecologists, they're going to become biologists, or they're going to become legislators who care about the environment. They're going to become doctors who care about the environment and can pledge money to support a society or create. So that's some, um, you know, with the, 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 the wealthy children that I teach, I'm hoping that I can leave a, a, a good imprint that when they get older, you know, they'll know that, oh, Mr. O'Shea told me that these bugs are good and I should help them. That's great. And that's so important. And it's it's such a great um, educator, the outdoors, right? You, you have yeah. shared outdoor classroom day. And I think, you know, it's not, mm. it shouldn't just be one day a year. You know, what a great teacher nature is, right? So practical, yeah. something it, they can use for life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a shame that for a lot of teachers out there and administrators and, and schools, um, you know, nature, the word play, outdoor play, it can be pejorative. It's a, it's a negative. What are these kids doing outdoors? They should be inside learning. You know, um, and, there, and it, sadly, over the years in my teaching career, I've, I've butted heads with people like that. I've worked with people like that. I've had teachers down the hallway for me like that who just... You're going outside again? You mean I'm going outside again? That's where we should be all the time. That's where the, the, that's where the magic happens. That's where the wonder happens, especially for curious children, right? Yeah. What's more exciting? Even, even if I'm going to have like a literacy class, to sit outside in a garden and do my reading or sit in my classroom with my fluorescent lights, you know? Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm luckily, thankfully, I can say that um, my current school – is definitely not like that. My current school is very supportive of outdoor initiatives. I mean, I work at a school where it's okay for the kids to climb trees at recess. Wow, awesome. I mean, yeah, right? Like, So, I mean, I took a picture one time and shared it on Twitter. I said, I love the fact, and I took a picture of some kids in the tree and I said, I, I love the fact that I work at a school where the kids are allowed to climb trees and the uh, headmaster left a comment. He said, it's only okay if they make it to the top. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, also, you are very active even indoors. So if you can't go outdoors, I notice you're a huge fan of kendama. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, there we go. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> um, yeah, kendama. What a great what a great brain break toy. Um, so for those of you who don't know, a kendama is a traditional Japanese skill toy. Um, kind of like cup and ball, but on steroids. Um, and, uh, you know, Kendama is something I started playing 
a little bit before I left Japan. But once I left Japan, I really got into it. Um, so kendama has become a lot more popular in America now. And with a lot of things, um, a lot of the kids who use them are very hip looking, very kind of skateboarder culture-ish, their fashion. And they make really cool edits of videos they put on YouTube. Just they make it look like the most insane, cool thing ever. So uh, yeah, when I got to Beijing, I bought a whole bunch of cheap ones on Taobao, which is the equivalent of like Rakuten. And um, I, uh, I started introducing it to my students. And um, it just, it's, a great, it's a great focus toy. Like when you're playing your kendama, you don't think of anything else in the world except for trying to get your trick. And um, when I and introduced it's a it to whole, my class, I it's found it's a that, whole body thing. It's not, it's not yeah. just doing your hand. You have to, to do it best, you have to stand up. You have to balance, yeah. you know, it's skill, yeah. it's, it's coordination. I love your videos of you doing tricks on Instagram. It's too cute. And then a little <laughs> thumbs up at the end every time. <laughs> oh, you'll see, you'll see. Okay, you've seen those. Yeah, I I, some of the that. tricks when I do them, like when you see the <laughs> excitement in my face, like that's legit. Like uh, there's like, there's a few moments where like I try to trick like about 80 times filming and then finally I got it. And you can just see me, I'm just like, ah! <laughs> yeah. and I'm like that in school too. We, like, we uh, had when the, I land a trick. Yeah, that's awesome. We had the Kendama Championships here in Hatsukaichi in Hiroshima. So they make, oh, yeah, they're year, famous right? for making the kendama here, and yeah, it's really fun to watch oh, the people. So good, man! Amazing. Uh, someday I'm gonna, someday I'm gonna go there to watch. Yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 I follow that on YouTube very closely. The world, the kendama world championships down there. Yeah. So um, it won't be in the cards. I, I'm assuming that probably won't be happening this year. Um, but yeah, probably maybe not. next year. Probably not. But yeah. maybe next year or the year after, I, I want to come to, to just to see. Yeah, yeah. it's fun. Uh, getting back to your nature a little bit, we had a question. Uh, I'd like to hear how your love for nature, birds, insects, was born. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, well, I grew up in nature. And I grew up in a very small fishing village in eastern Canada, Nova Scotia. Less than a thousand people. Um, I'm, you know, I won't lie. I'm, I'm middle-aged. So, you know, I grew up in the, I was a child of the eighties, you know, pre-internet and all that jazz. So, um, we played outdoors all the time, but I think during that time period, I took it for granted. Um, I also had two parents who were avid birders and I learned a lot about birds in Canada, but through osmosis, it was always not, not cause I was interested, but it was always like my mom dragging me to the window, like Kevin, look at the bird feeder. You know, there's a, male bohemian waxwing and a bunch of this and that and I was like oh, okay mom um and then years later people would wonder like how do you know that's a male bohemian waxwing on the tree Kevin I'm like oh. but uh, I think it was really when I moved to Japan um that's what did it it was in my late well my early 30s that the kind of fire got lit um I was fortunate enough to work at a small international kindergarten in the city of Akashi and our, our school was in an office building so we didn't have a playground. But luckily, a five minute walk away was Akashi Koen, Akashi Park, which is, I think they say about the size of New York's Central Park. So it's a massive sprawling park with trails and forests and ponds and streams. And, and we would take our students there every morning for at least two to three hours. And we just explored. And um, I, at the local bookstore in the train station, they happen to have two very local guidebooks. There was Akashi no Tori, the birds of Akashi, and Akashi no Mushi, the bugs of Akashi. And these books were created by some kind of nature organization in the city, and they were specific for the park. So I had a field guide to the park, and I just, I started jumping in. And I think what's really amazing about Japan is that, and I was explaining this to some people on a, a podcast the other day, the Open Door podcast, that there's a real connection to nature in Japan that we don't have in other places. I mean, like insects are celebrated. I mean, it's just like a rite of passage for kids to catch cicadas in the summer. You see kids running around everywhere with nets, catching cicadas and butterflies. You don't see kids in America or Canada doing this. There's books galore everywhere. The shelves in the stores are filled with stuff about um, keeping beetles and raising beetles. Like raising beetles is a huge thing, as you know, here in Japan. Um, the TV shows, there's so many TV shows teaching about insects. 
that I kind of that all kind of sucked me in, and I loved it. Um, I, re, I still remember the name of the. There was a boy named Kaito in 2008 who taught me how to catch how to catch a cicada with my hand, and it freaked me out. Like to actually when they're sitting on the tree to grab it with your fingers and pull it off. And I mean, I probably had about 30 tries of like, <laughs> but I finally learned how to catch a cicada with my bare hands. And so I think the passion grew from being here in Japan. Um, you know, the TV shows, the culture around insects. And it just, it sucked me in. And what happens with me now um, is I'm seasonal. So as fall comes and the insects start to disappear, then I go to birds. So like in the winter time, my pages turn into bird photography. And then once lovely spring comes around and little critters start coming to life, then I switch kind of back to my bug photography. But um, yeah, that's, that's how it happened for me. Um, and uh, yeah, so Japan, Japan hooked me. And now, I mean, you were raised around birders, like you say, and now you're raising your kids to love and appreciate nature as well, as well as your students. So you're, you're really yeah. passing on that enthusiasm for nature, which I think yeah. now is, you know, more important than ever for kids to just get out there and, and realize how important nature is and how we need to protect it, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, try to, making, try to make lemonade out of lemons, a positive spin of this awful COVID-19 time will be in different places around the world um, that... I'm hoping that with these stay home orders and lockdowns, people not able to go to the shopping malls or the department stores, not all the, these kind of distractions that we normally have. A lot of people, and we mentioned this actually pre-interview, um, more people now, according to like, um, you know, uh, the Audubon Society and stuff are birding more than ever. And people have the time now to stop and slow down and, and look out that back window. And it's, it's been incredible. Like what's happening? Like, anyone out there listening like you've got to follow the Autobahn society on Facebook because the stuff they're doing is incredible during this time like all of these incredible zoom classes that they're showing with these incredible experts David Sibley who's one of the most famous bird artists in the world has been doing all these classes teaching you how to for free teaching you how to draw birds um, like there's some incredible content available to us about nature now more than ever before because people are stuck at home and people are getting out for walks. People are, are are noticing the things that they never noticed before in their backyard. Like again, those birds, those blue jays, those cardinals. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that once things normalize, I'm hoping a lot of that will stick with adults and their kids. But it, it's it's really important for that adult buy-in, I mm -hmm. find, because kids are easy, man. Kid, kids love bugs. Like, I'm, you know, kids just love, like they love it. You know, you've got kids, you watch them grow up and, they're friends, and I mean, like, how exciting is it to catch cicadas in the summertime, or to catch it to catch a big grasshopper and yeah. show your mom and dad, right? But but it's the parents who are the ones who are like, ew, that's gross, ew, yeah. ew, that's dangerous. I was, you gotta change. I that was much. very tolerant, and then I I learned it's a lot of trial and error along the way, you know, like when your kids love collecting, what is that seed? Is it the ginkgo tree, the ginkgo nuts that they collect? They love collecting them. Oh, okay, yeah. Donguri, is it? Oh, and Donguri, those are acorns. Acorns, okay. Well, my kids were yeah. really into that, and I like, I of really course, encouraged yeah. it. Oh, that's fantastic. And then I started realizing they have loads of bugs inside of them, but we didn't, <laughs> we didn't learn it early enough, and like the whole toy <laughs> chest yeah. was swarming with bugs inside the house. So, yeah. you know, you, you learn that you want to keep that collection outside, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are the, uh, they have, there's, um, oh gosh, what are the, there's uh, two different types of larvae that, that burrow into the acorns. So it's, it's a type of moth. There's an acorn moth, and there's another one that's a, uh, it's a type of beetle. But um, I learned that too the hard way, because like in Canada, we don't collect acorns really. I don't remember doing that as a kid. But when I was first teaching in the kindergarten in Akashi, um, my, my kids would fill their pockets with the acorns and come to school and dump them in their little cubbies. Yeah. And it was like one day I remember like my, my TA screaming and there's all these like little maggots crawling around all over the kid's locker. And I'm like, and, and every acorn had like this little perfect hole in it I know where the, the maggot had crawled out. Yeah. And it was just like, wow, oh gosh. <laughs> it's, it's a great yeah. learning right. experience, but you only do that once. 
Um, let's yeah, let's right. talk a little bit about your online education stuff because I, I found that really interesting and you've been such a great support of teachers trying to get started as well as your you yourself have had some hurdles with um, expectations of parents you were writing about. You want to talk about that a little bit? How it's been a transition well, to online classes? Yeah. Yeah, well, luckily our journey has come to an end. Um, basically, Wednesday is our last day of school at my school. And I know a lot of other international schools have even wrapped up like last Friday. So I'm very, very, very thankful my online learning journey has come to an end. Um, yeah, it, it, it was, it's was it been a bumpy ride. And I, I, I think any teacher out there in the world will attest to the same. Um, I, I spent a lot of time back in February giving out a lot of advice just simply because being a China-based teacher, we um, unfortunately started this online learning earlier than everybody else, right? And then it was, at that time when I was in China, we, we learned that our school would be closing during the, the Chinese New Year holiday. So we weren't even in school together. There was like no chance for meetings or planning. We were literally on holiday, teachers scattered around the world, and they're like, the school's not opening, we're going online. You guys as teams figure out how this is gonna work. And it was literally like throwing spaghetti at a wall and seeing what would stick. Um, it was just in the initial days, weeks, fumbling in the dark. You know, how do you take, I teach pre-kindergarten. So my students are four and five years old. We're a very outdoor based school. We don't use technology. Like we had iPads, but we never use them. Um, so how do we transition that, especially in age group where it's all about social and emotional growth? We're not, it's not academic. They're not reading and writing yet, right? It's all about how do you make friends? How do you solve disputes with other friends? And so how do you transition that into online learning? So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm luckily that I have an incredibly collaborative, supportive team, my year level team. We've got five teachers and a great vice principal who works closely with us. And um, we use an app called Seesaw. Um, and we, we would create activities and send them out. Initially, we were sending, we'd send out a ton of activities and the parents were just like, oh my God, too much. So we'd dial it back. Parents were still like, too much. We'd dial it back. And then we're hearing like, you know, too much screen time. So then we, we started creating activities where the kids didn't need technology to do the activity. They just needed it to document it. So for example, it might be a counting activity or sorting, but they would have to go outdoors to a park and collect leaves and count leaves and sort leaves and have their parents document it. Um, you know, we went through a lot of these phases. We created um, one thing that became very popular and our, my whole school uh, ended up adopting it. And then other schools adopted this idea too after I shared it on Twitter. We had a no tech Wednesday where basically we would send out, because you know, I, my own two children, I've got a seven year old and a nine year old and they're just stuck to their tablets all day long um, doing this online learning. Um, and we, uh, so what we did is we, we would give out like a shopping list, a grocery list of, of activities. Because one thing that we learned was that a lot of our parents didn't know how to parent, no idea what to do with their kids. Because um, again, I'm in China, oh, I'm in Osaka right now, but based in China, which is a nanny culture. They call them IEs. Um, and even families that aren't wealthy have nannies. And these nannies essentially raise the children. They cook the kids meals, they bring the kids to school, they give the kids their baths. The parents are very hands off. Parents go to work and enjoy life. And if you're rich, you shop and travel a lot. Um, so when this happened during Chinese New Year, that's the one time of the year where a lot of these nannies are able to travel back to their hometowns. So when the COVID-19 really hit and things got locked down and transport stopped in China, a lot of these families were stuck with their own children for the first time. And a lot of them had no idea what to do. So we would actually have to give a list of things. You know, we might give a, 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 20 ideas and then we would give a list of conversation starters. These are questions you can ask your child while doing these activities. And we would send that out on Wednesday night or Tuesday night and we'd send out an instructional video. And we'd say, watch this, copy the list of activities. Do not turn on the device tomorrow and enjoy the day with your child. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it's, it's been a journey. I and think it's, it's been a transition, not only for parents in China or Japan, but that a lot of the American TV shows or comedy news shows like Samantha Bee or Seth Meyers, they've been talking about it a lot and how we need to pay teachers more because 
I'm trying to do homework with my kid and I cannot handle it. Like, how do they do it, right? And then you, you <laughs> yeah. realize how vital the teacher's role is in raising your kid, not just for finishing homework or doing classes, right? So yeah. I think that transition yeah, no. for a typical parent into teacher mode has been a real eye-opener, which in a good yeah. way, they appreciate teachers more, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I, I've seen from the other end of Seesaw um, and, and things where I sit, I've seen some teachers, uh, some parents really step up to the plate and really impress me. And I have to admit, there's, there, there were a few parents that I had one set of views upon, for example, before this happened. Um, there, were, there were some parents who I felt personally were too hands off and maybe not so caring and they really didn't know their child. And what I saw during the online period, online learning period was those parents really step up to the plate and really impress me um, with the job they were doing as home teachers. Um, so, you know, for me, I think as a teacher, I've learned to not always judge so quickly as well from my side of things. That's really important yeah. for all of us to remember. You know, you can't judge a book by its cover. It's that famous saying that exactly. it's so true. Yeah. Uh, one of the pictures yeah. in your Instagram is growing your own food. <laughs> Do you do that at your school? Oh, yeah, well? yeah. Yeah, um, that's something I've always been passionate about. Um, ever since my days in Kobe, living in Kobe, my balcony, we always had a beautiful balcony garden my wife and I took care of. And I've always grown food. I don't want to grow ornamental stuff. I want to grow things I can eat and my family can eat. Um, and uh, at my, yeah, every school I've worked at, when I was working in Kobe, teaching, we would always have a garden. Um, often that was kind of, I was on point for that one. Um, and again, it would be food because that's, you know, you want to teach children, where does food come from? Um, and when I, I always remember the great, the great memory I have um, of when my son was in kindergarten, um, especially when he was like maybe great four years old and we would grow tomatoes on our balcony. And in the morning, my wife would make his bento um, and he, his, his job, he was tasked to go to the balcony and pick tomatoes for his own lunch. And I remember he'd go and he'd pick like three, two or three little cherry tomatoes and he'd come in and he'd wash them and dry them and put them in his bento. And he was always so proud and satisfied looking that he just went out and harvested like his food that he was going to eat today for lunch. So um, with, uh, you know, in Shenzhen where I'm at, um, I started gardening. And this is a really cool story. I started gardening. Um, uh, big balcony, massive balcony, and I started balcony gardening and sharing a lot of the photos with my principal, my elementary principal. And he was like, this looks really interesting. So he started gardening. And he said, I haven't had a hobby in like 20 years. And he's just loving it. And he, not only did he just create a, a, a garden on his balcony, he went out and he said, you know what, let's make this happen at school. He's like, I'm in control of the budget. I can do this. And he got about 30 massive custom planters made and on the rooftop of our elementary building, he started this huge garden and he created a gardening club and he just ran off with it. And I was just like, wow. Um, so, I mean, just, you know, thousands of tomatoes and cucumbers and wonderful things being harvested. And the children are taking them home and the teaching assistants are taking them home. And, uh, you know, it seems like some other people at my school have caught the bug. So I'm, I'm really impressed with that. That's awesome. Because in, you know, when I grew up, in the States, um, they were just starting to bring in soda machines, right? And then now okay. they're trying to get soda machines out of the schools. The kids have too much sugar in their diets and stuff. But wouldn't it be amazing if all schools had gardens and the kids were yes. tasked with growing vegetables and yeah. having fresh vegetables as part of their lunch experience or oh, yeah. dining experience? It's awesome. That would be incredible. And I mean, and, th and that, that, that garden becomes such an incredible learning place, a classroom. I mean, maybe you're doing a unit of inquiry where you're learning about bees and pollinators. Well, guess what? You're going to find them in your garden. And then you can get that real hands-on connection of, like, what is pollination? There it is in practice. And if it wasn't for these bees or these butterflies or these wasps, we wouldn't have these cucumbers. We wouldn't have these beans. They're making it happen. Um, and, you know, not just not just growing vegetables, but to have like a, a portion, maybe like a wild garden. This is something that I was hoping to start at my, my school, but then mm. COVID-19 came along. But a wild garden, where for a lot of the uneducated, might just look like a pile of garbage. But like I would create like piles of sticks and wood 
that that bees, carpenter bees, can use as habitats, and geckos can crawl in there to make the bee hotels, to, to have lots of wildflowers growing tall, to have clover. Um, this is something that I also plan on, on getting underway when I get back to Shenzhen. And, and then creating plaques. This is, what, this is an idea my principal and I have, where like informational plaques, like these are the different things that will live in this area. Um, and then actually roping it off so there's a pathway through it so the kids can't kids can't just run around in it because then you're destroying a habitat yeah um but yeah so and so then these have are, like a section you know, for composting well. as well you have a composting yeah, section yeah. so then they can understand about the scraps of food i don't eat can go back to dirt and then understanding that cycle of dirt maybe catch rainwater yeah. and understand about the importance of water for plants and everything and there's so much you can do studying insects yeah. on the plants you know mm. how to how to naturally well, control pests that kind of thing yeah it's really exciting and i mean i think what i've i've i'm also like a big proponent of, of organic and staying away from chemicals and um again you know teaching the kids is great learning moments I, i think of a school garden i had in kobe where um some kids were really sad because um uh, caterpillars started um attacking their basil And the caterpillars were, and then what we noticed one day was that there was a bunch of paper wasps always flying around the basil. And that was a great learning moment where we went, we went out and observed and we set up cameras on tripods and filmed that these wasps were actually picking off the caterpillars and flying off with them and eating them. And I'm like, guys, see, <laughs> these, these caterpillars are destroying your basil, but now these wasps are coming to kill the caterpillars. Like this is, you know, that's the kind of lending to where we talked about earlier on, um, Yeah. There's so many my, learning moments. My husband was uh, warning me about our ume tree. We have a ume plum tree, and it had beautiful white blossoms, so I knew that fruit was coming soon. And he said there is a really painful caterpillar with spiky hairs, which yeah. um, is famous in the ume tree around Hiroshima, he heard, so be careful. And then I noticed bees around the tree, and I, I didn't see the caterpillar, and I thought, I bet the bees are doing me a favor, or the wasps, yeah. they're taking those yeah. caterpillars away, right? So yeah. I, I never a, got stung, which was nice. Yeah, there's a lot of those, uh, I think the season has kind of passed a bit, but here in Osaka, and when I was, I was hiking a couple of weeks ago up in Mount Roko in Kobe, and those big fuzzy caterpillars, I mean, that's the thing in Japan, most of them, they're poisonous hairs, those things were falling out of the trees like rain, I was scared to death. Was, <laughs> They come like, oh, down, oh. right? <laughs> So yeah, when I'm when I'm out there out. now because I'm not very good at at weeding, so it is kind of wild out there. I have to cover head to foot, you know, because you can get some pretty ouchy stings from those caterpillars. Oh yeah, I've learned the hard way many times in Japan. I mean, and often I just had I've just had one fall out of a tree and land on me, and all those hairs getting like your shirt and stuff like that. So even if you like remove your shirt, the hairs are touching you and. Ugh. Um, my son had a painful experience with one actually a few weeks, but about a month ago, um, one landed on his shoulder while we were playing at a park, and he was just all covered with red welts and stuff oh, for about man. a week. Yeah, they're they're powerful poison. Um, uh, mm. Joanna says, "Great vision, good luck setting it all up. It's so important to reconnect with nature. I wish I had a garden like that at school when I was small. I think that's yeah. great. Thank you, Joanna. It's a great comment. That's so true, Thank isn't you. it?" Yeah. Because, like, uh, wasn't it Jamie Oliver in the UK? He took a bunch of vegetables to a school, and the kids didn't know what the vegetables were. They'd never seen fresh vegetables. They didn't know a tomato from an eggplant or a cucumber because they'd never seen a raw, fresh vegetable. How sad is that, right? In our yeah. modern, convenient lives that we're getting so far away from the food. Well, I mean, like even even here in Osaka. So, I mean, for all of you out there watching and listening, um, the reason why I'm still here after four months is because China closed its borders early on, and we can't get back home. So we're basically trapped here. Um, but it's a good place to be trapped. Um, <laughs> but we we um, we my family of four has been staying in a one room apartment, and it's it's a modern building, but it's one room, right? So you're on top of each other all the time. So I wanted to create a new space for us to get away from things. So I went up to the balcony and I scrubbed the balcony and cleaned the balcony, bought some camping chairs, and I went out to Conan Home Center and I bought seedlings. I bought two tomato plants, I bought two green pepper plants and some strawberries. And right now, 
um, on our little balcony, we've probably got this, the tomato plants are as tall as I am, and we've probably got about 200 tomatoes growing. And we've been, uh, my daughter's been going out and harvesting the green peppers, which we've been using to make pizza toast and spaghetti sauce. And um, so even, even here in our temporary situation, I can't, I need to have food growing. Yeah. <laughs> and I love to sit outside at night with a drink in my hand and just look at my tomato plants and count the tomatoes. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really a nice thing to have. That's awesome. Well, that's that's our hour. And uh, thank you so much, Kevin. So much great insight. And if people want to find you, uh, definitely check out your Instagram for all of your great nature yep. photos. And uh, making makingbetterteachers.com for your insights yep. into teaching. And uh, good right. luck with everything. And I hope it works out and you can go back to China. And if not, you know, all your online teaching. I hope it goes well. And <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure talking today. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Uh, we're back tomorrow. We have a talk at 5 o'clock with Victoria Close, who does Biku Designs. She upcycles old kimonos and things into accessories. So please join us then. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much for your comments. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.